I woke up this morning and thought my face felt a little bit hot. Felt fine, no big problem, but wanted no particular reason why I should have a fever. I went downstairs, made myself a cup of coffee, booted up my computer, went over to the CEM website, and immediately found out what my problem is. It says there, 140, 104 days to the Feast of Tabernacles. So I immediately diagnosed myself as having a very early onset of feast fever. Very mild case so far, but it will get worse as the summer goes on, and I trust many of you will feel the same way as you see the Feast of Tabernacles approaching this year. In Deuteronomy 16, beginning in verse 13, are some instructions which I think are worth reviewing, maybe at this time of the year while we still got a little planning time coming toward the feast. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after you have gathered in your corn and your wine, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates, everybody is to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Seven days you shall keep a solemn feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord shall choose, because the Lord shall, your, your God shall bless you in all your increase. Now, mind you, notice there's a curious little thing about here you can overlook if you're not careful. It doesn't say if the Lord your God will bless you. It says the Lord your God will bless you in all your increase, and in all the works of your hands, and therefore you shall surely rejoice. Now, that's a very strong wording. Uh, there's not no ifs, ands, or buts about it. God says, I will bless you, and you will rejoice, and you will like it. Uh, of course, what's not to party over, but that is the commandment to us, is to rejoice, and not only that we are to rejoice, but are to see to it that the people around us are able to rejoice, all the way down to man, men servants and, and maid servants and the fatherless and the widows, people who have no one to take care of them. We're supposed to do this. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, in the Feast of Tabernacles. And you shall not appear empty-handed before the Lord. When you come to appear before God, every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Flat commandment. This is something you are supposed to do. Three times in a year, you're supposed to appear before God, and when you appear before God, you're supposed to bring an offering to God when you come. Now, there is an odd question here. He says we're supposed to do this in the place where the Lord your God shall choose to put his name there. Now, in the Bible, the use of name in this, in this way is speaking about his authority, wherever God places his authority or authorizes a feast to be kept. How do we know where God has placed his name or placed his authority. Well, listen, and perhaps it's a coincidence, but the very next verse says this. Judges and officers shall you make you in all your gates which the Lord your God gives you throughout all your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Now, there are other scriptures in relation to this, but this particular verse follows right on the heels of the statement about where God shall choose to place his name. And you may not realize this, but and many people do not seem to, that the place was not always Jerusalem. Everyone thinks, Feast of Tabernacles, well, you have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Oh, no. Jerusalem was a late arrival on the scene. The Feast of, I mean, the Tabernacle was not even there. The Tabernacle was kept up in Shiloh for a while, and I believe before Shiloh in another location, the Ark actually dwelt in the city of David for a while. Uh, the place was not necessarily the city of Jerusalem. The place was where God's authority had been placed, or where God says, keep the feast. Put it that simple. Wherever God says, keep the feast, that's what you're supposed to do. The fact is, judges and officers have to decide a number of issues so that the people of God can worship properly. In early days, for example, the Israelites were allowed to offer their offerings just about anywhere. But later on, those judges and officers said, no, no, you can't do that. These offerings must be made in Jerusalem, at the temple, in the way prescribed, in the law, and therefore that, that, that regulation was followed. Now, the place for... The feast is one of those issues that the judges had to decide for the people as to how they were observe it, exactly where they were to observe it, and many of the aspects of that observation. For example, they would have had to have made decisions at some early time regarding the instructions in Leviticus that you're supposed to take the boughs of goodly trees, the branches of palm trees and thick trees and so forth, and build booths for everybody. 
the judges would have to realize that that's not something you could do every year. Because in the second or third year, there will be no more trees, no more palm trees, no more nothing that we can use to build, build these out of. And so decisions were made early on that they would not always do that. In fact, the implication is that from the time of Joshua all the way down to the time of Nehemiah, they did not attempt to build booths out of trees in or around Jerusalem. The place for the feast is one of those kinds of issues. Now, when you come down to the New Testament, the authority for Christians as to how they are to do worship God, where and when they're supposed to worship God, didn't rest with the priesthood as it did with the Old Testament judges. It rested with a different set of men. You'll find this in Matthew 16 and verse 18. This is the occasion where Jesus asked the apostles, that, Who do they say that I am? And they told him all manner of things, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, Christ said, Blessed are you, Peter, because nobody's revealed this to you but God. Then he says in verse 18, I say unto you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This was not said merely to Peter. It was also said later on to all the other apostles, but I want to stop right here for a moment before I go on and explain something to you. There has been a lot of agonizing over this scripture. A lot of Protestant theologians have done everything in their power to try to retranslate it, to make it mean something that it doesn't say here, because of their concern that this seems in their mind to establish Peter as the apostle who made binding and loosening decisions. He had the keys to the kingdom. And, of course, the Roman Catholics believe this, that Peter alone had the keys to the kingdom and that whatever he bound was bound, whatever he loosed was loose, and that whoever sat in Peter's office down through apostolic succession could bind and loose anything for the church. Well, the theologians work a little too hard on that, actually, because the King James translation here is as good as it gets. I've looked at this very carefully, studied the Greek, analyzed the tenses of the verb, and there is no reason to play with this particular passage of Scripture. Because any fool should know that Jesus was not giving Peter the authority to bind or loose anything contrary to the law of God. You know, any fool should know that. But it's also obvious that there are many aspects of things in the law of God that need definition as to how, where, and when. There are all manner of doubtful issues that cannot be resolved easily by Scripture. In fact, there are many issues that after years of study in the Church of God, we have still not been able to resolve. There are two sides of an argument. Neither side can close out the other side of the argument. And so rather than making a binding or loosing decision so that we can all do the same thing together, uh, people begin dividing off and creating new churches and dividing and splitting in a hundred different directions because each person decides for himself what is the right thing to do. Well, each one of us is free to do that. But the problem with being free to do that is that we separate ourselves consistently from our brothers. Jesus' statement to ancient Israel, you'll have judges and officers that will decide these. Now to his apostles, you will decide these things, was done so that in those matters which would otherwise split the church a hundred ways from Sunday, would not do so, that we would have a decision that we could live by and go forward with. That's the reason why this was done. And this verse says, whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. It does not say shall have been, having been bound before in heaven. In other words, the, the way it is interpreted by some is that you can only bind on earth what has already been bound in heaven. You know, what, well, then what do we have any decision-making thing for? What's the purpose? What are we even talking about here? What he's talking about is simply this. There are areas where the Bible is vague, where the Bible is not specific. And when you make a decision for the church in these matters. I'll back it up. Whatever you loose will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing decisions within the law, not outside the law, on matters of law that are doubtful and not so easy, things that would divide us if each of us decided on them for ourselves. That's not really that hard. And it will really only have to do with the things that we do together. It really doesn't affect your personal decision. Nobody cares what color car you're going to buy when you go down to the dealer next week. But the things that we do together, 
where we keep the feast together, where we have church together, what time we have services, you know, what calendar we're going to follow for the sacred year, where our, where our holy days are going to fall. These are matters someone, has, someone somewhere has to decide, or else the church will divide as many ways as there are people in the church to divide. Now, in Matthew 18, we have a little different presentation of this same principle, and I want to go here so that you understand. This was not just handing this down to Peter alone. And the context of Matthew 18 makes it abundantly clear he was not. And it starts off with an unrelated issue. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. If he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established in the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, who knows what this is? Who knows what kind of a dispute exists between you and me? But if i got a problem with you, I'm supposed to go to you first by, by ourselves, and we'll talk this over, and we're supposed to be able to sort it out. If we can't, well, I go get a couple of other people and come in, and they listen while we talk this out so that there are witnesses to what I promised and what you promised, what I affirmed and what you denied. we got all this stuff born witness to, and we try to sort this out. The witnesses can help. If he refuses to listen to the witnesses, then come in and tell it to the church. If he refuses even to listen to the church... Treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. You know, the guy is obviously not your brother if he won't even listen to the church. So there comes a time where the church renders decisions in matters which we all are expected to follow. Now, the church isn't going to take us out and hang us if we, we don't follow those decisions. We're not condemned to hell if we don't follow those decisions. We're not necessarily excommunicated if we follow those decisions, except for the fact that if a man won't listen to the church, it says treat him like a publican or a tax collector. How do we treat them? We pay our taxes. We speak to them on the street. We treat them with, with respect. But we do recognize the fact there's no brother of ours. That's basically what's working on this particular passage of Scripture. Then he says this, to tell, uh, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever who binds, who looses? The church. In this case, it's the church. He says, again, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth, as anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, I'm there in the midst. Now, this puts a whole new light on a common idea that many people have about agreeing together in prayer. The idea is that, well, if you and I get together and we both agree, we're both going to ask for this thing in prayer, God, will have, God has to do it for us. That's not what this is about. What this is about is binding or loosing decisions that are made in the church, and it also includes another interesting element. No one person can make binding and loosing decisions alone. Two or three have to be involved in these decisions. So if you have officers in your church, know that you can't have a, let's say, a single person who is the president of your church who makes binding and loosing decisions for your church. No one person can have that kind of authority. It's two or three that have to be involved in that kind of decisions at a minimum because no one person should be calling shots for the, for the entirety of the church. Now, this is an interesting passage of Scripture because it basically tells us that there is authority in the church. The church has the responsibility to make decisions. Those decisions are bound in heaven once they are made. Now, obviously, I mean, no one should have to tell us that we have no business making decisions to move our church services to Sunday. We're Sabbatarian. We keep the Sabbath day. We can't play with that. But we can make decisions about whether the church is going to meet at 10 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We can make decisions which, which Sabbaths out of the month we're going to have potlucks. We can make decisions that we are going to follow the normative Jewish calendar, which we have done for years, and, and that decision is a tacit decision long since made. We can make that decision, and consequently the church will be here keeping Pentecost or keeping a given holy day on a certain date. Now, you have the option, of course, of deciding on a different one, but when the church gets together, you won't be here. Or when you decide to do your church meeting, we won't be there. And this is the kind of thing which Jesus intended for the church to make decisions which were binding upon everybody, including where we're going to be and when we're going to be there, and these are things that we are expected to follow. Now, today the human leadership of the church is fractured, and sometimes we may indeed be reduced to two or three together in Jesus' name and his authority because that's all that's left by the time we get through bickering and arguing about some of the things that we want to argue about. 
Now, this does not in any way liberate us from the commandment. And when the call goes forth, that is the commandment regarding the Feast of Tabernacles. And when the call goes forth, come to the feast, we're bound to go somewhere. Wherever God's people are gathered to fe- go to the feast, we, God expects us to be there. That much seems abundantly clear to me in the Scriptures, and I will be demonstrating more of that as I go along. Exodus 23, verse 14. Three times in a year shall you keep a feast to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you in the time appointed of the month of Abib. For in it you came out from Egypt, and no one shall appear before me empty-handed. And the feast of harvest, the feast of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when you have gathered in your labor, uh, in, your, all in, in all of your labors of the field. Three times in a year all of your males shall appear before the Lord your God. Where? Well, wherever his people are appointed to keep the feast. The minimum requirement is all the males. But the commandment goes on to say you'll celebrate with your wife, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant. No one is exempted from observing the Feast of Tabernacles. Obviously, not everyone in the ancient time could be in Jerusalem or the, in the central place for the feast every year because of the distances and the times that were involved. But nevertheless, the men were expected to be there. Exodus 34. Celebrate the Feast of... And this is verse 22. Celebrate the Feast of Weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the turn of the year. That's the Feast of Tabernacles, otherwise called ingathering. Three times a year all your men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. You go to appear before me. You don't worry about what you're leaving behind. I'll take care of it. That's what God promises to do to Israel of old. Now, how were the people to afford this? You know, to pick up and go to Jerusalem and, and stop your work at home and, and live in a city another place, someplace else away from home for eight days that you were going expected to be there, and how to support yourself when you're on the road going and coming is an important question. That's a question God answers in Deuteronomy 14 in verse 22. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your seal, the seed that the feed, field brings forth year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of your corn, your wine, your oil, the firstlings of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Now, this is a much, much vexed question among many theologians, but just let me tell you the bottom line of it, that the tithe, all the tithe of Israel was originally given to Levi. So when this talks about a tithe that you are allowed to take with you to the place where God put his name there and eat it, it's talking about a second tithe. You may oftentimes hear people refer to their second tithe or second tithe this or a festival tithe otherwise known. But this is a commandment that after you paid your first tithe, this tithe you lay aside for yourself and your family. You do not give it to the church. You don't give it to the ministry, although you are allowed certainly to make an offering out of it to God if you wish to do so. But it's for you. It's for your family. It's so you can keep the Feast of Tabernacles. He goes on to say, if the way is too far from you, so you can't carry all this seed, if the place is too far which the Lord your God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall turn it into money, bind up the money in your hand, and you shall go to the place which the Lord your God shall choose. And you shall bestow that money for whatever you want, whatever your soul lusts after, to use the King James Version, for oxen, a steak, big roast, for sheep, leg of lamb perhaps, or rack of lamb, done just the way you like it, for wine, strong drink, whatever your soul desires, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and celebrate you and your household. All of you are supposed to be down there celebrating if God makes it possible for you to be there. And don't forget the Levite, because he doesn't have an inheritance, be sure and Keep him in your mind as well. Now, this is a second tithe. It is not to be given to God. It is to be spent by you and your family to keep the feast. I give it, People oftentimes talk about the difficulty of this and they feel that they can't afford it. My advice is very simple. If you think you can't afford the second tithe, do it anyway. Set up an account for it. 
If you have an emergency, if it absolutely comes right down to it, then do as David did. I mean, you have to do like David when he ate the showbread. Well, then so be it. But you need to take the effort so God can bless you enough so you might not have to do that. If you will just simply make the effort to save the second tithe, put it aside, wait for God's blessing. I believe that God will be merciful to you if you have a problem, if you have to use that money for something, if your kids have a medical emergency. If you use that money for that, I believe God's grace will cover that. But at the same time, if you never make the effort in the first place, you never even give God's blessing a chance to cover it for you. So my advice, save the festival tithe. Plan to attend the Feast of Tabernacles. Put that money aside and keep your fingers off of it. If God blesses you enough that you do not have to use it for anything else, then come to the feast and celebrate to your heart's content. That money is yours to spend on you and to spend on your family. I say it's yours. In a way, it's God's given to you to spend on yourself. He wants you, frankly, to have more than usual at the Feast of Tabernacles so when all is said and done, you're full up to here, not only with food, but with being with God and being with friends and, and with the Spirit of God that would be there. And never assume you have to justify yourself to any man in this matter. This is solely between you and God. And now Leviticus 23, the definitive scripture about the Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus 23 and verse 34. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. The first day is a holy convocation. You do no servile work therein. I think we understand. Basically, work that is done for food and for the preparations of the feast are perfectly permissible. It's the normal work-a-day work that's not supposed to be done. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. The eighth day is also a holy convocation to you. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. Of course, we can't offer those offerings to the Lord now because the temple is not there. There is no priesthood. The offerings cannot be offered according to the law, so that part of this particular law cannot be kept today. These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations to make an offering by fire to God. Then he says in verse 39, In the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days. The first day is a Sabbath. The eighth day is a Sabbath. On the first day, you take the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in a year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Then he says, you shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelite born shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses went and declared all the feasts of them to, to, the, 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 uh, to the Israelites. But as we have long, you know, long since noted, this is not merely an Israelite festival. And this is something that is often overlooked by people. They, they read the Bible, they think these things are interesting, but they think, well, that's all for the Jews. It's not for us. It doesn't have anything to do with us in this way. And they look perhaps at this, everyone that is Israelite born shall dwell in booths for seven days. But here's the problem. There is no other God to worship but God. There are no others. And if you're going to worship Jehovah, if you're going to worship the God of the Old Testament, if you're going to worship Jesus Christ, you are going to worship them the way they say you are to worship, whether you are a Jew, an Arab, an Egyptian, uh, an Amalekite, if you're going to worship God, there is one law to him that is homeborn and him that is a stranger who is among you. So let's don't start quibbling on this. But there is an interesting passage of Scripture. It's a prophecy. It's found in Zechariah 14. And I want to take just to take a few moments today to go through this passage because I think it's important for us to understand what the implications of it are. This is a prophecy of the end time. In Zechariah 14, it says this, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and your spoil shall be divided in the midst of you. I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, this is really a sobering passage of Scripture. We have been looking at this for years and wondering how this will play out in the end time. 
Because the one thing that is abundantly clear, I've said it on the radio, I've said it in sermons, there is another Holocaust coming. And it's going to be a terrible time for the Jewish people one more time before the end of the age. And what this says is that when the day of the Lord comes, we come right down to the very end time, all nations are going to be gathered against Jerusalem one more time to battle. And half the city is going to fall and be taken, and half of it is going to be left behind. And there's this incredible irony that, that hit me the first time I went to Jerusalem. You got a wall down the middle of the city when I went there the first time. They had East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. And I sat in a hotel in, in, in the Arab portion of Jerusalem on the west side and heard gunfire in the no man's land down in between the eastern and western Jerusalem. And I could sit there and I could think, half the city will go into captivity and the other half will be left. You can kind of see how that might be as we come down to the end time. And we are still in that situation today. They don't have the fence there. But the, the division of Jerusalem between Gentile and Jew, between Arabs and Jews, or Palestinians and Jews, is as clear as crystal. And so it's very hard to imagine that it isn't either the Jews or the Palestinians that are going to be carried away into captivity when you read this, is it? Somebody is gone. Half the city is gone at the very end time. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now the Lord takes a hand. His feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall split in the midst thereof toward the east and the west. And there will be a very great valley. Half the mountain shall move north. Half of it will move south. And you'll have a great split valley running from Jerusalem right on down to the Dead Sea. Now, I would think we're safe in assuming at this point this prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. We're also safe. In making a connection, I believe, between the last moments that anybody saw Jesus in person. They were standing on the Mount of Olives. The disciples were with him. Jesus gave him his last words, and he just ascended up into a cloud out of their sight. And they were standing there with their mouths open, hanging open, and, and, and all of a sudden an angel was with them. He said, what are you standing here gaping around with your mouth open? In like manner as you have seen him go, so shall he come. Just like you saw him go, he'll come back implying that the place of Jesus' return is the Mount of Olives, from whence he left. So, here's a prophecy of the return of Christ, him coming back to Jerusalem and planting his feet on the Mount of Olives. You'll flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you'll flee like you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and the Lord your God shall come, and all the saints with you, it shall come to pass in that day the light will not be clear nor dark. It will be one day that shall be known to the Lord, not day, not night, but it shall come to pass at evening time it shall be light. This is going to be an eerie time in around Jerusalem at this moment. And you can easily see why the fighting would stop. Incredible earthquake. Eerie light in the sky at night. No darkness, no brightness, and everybody pauses almost afraid to breathe. It shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half to the former sea, half toward the hinder sea. In summer and winter shall it be. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. There shall be one Lord and his name one. So do we, are we kind of getting the picture of where we are in history? This is a time still ahead of us now. It is a time between here and there where Jerusalem is going to fall again. And then God is going to take a hand and put a stop to all of this. And after that, he will be the Lord of all the earth. All the land, he said, shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. It will be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate, giving all the geographical details. Men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction. Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. We won't have any more car bombs, no more buses being blown up, no more mortar attacks on civilians. And then he says this, This shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes. You'd like to know what that looks like. See Raiders of the Lost Ark. Those closing scenes in Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they open that ark up and the thing comes out, gives you a perfect picture of this. Their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. It shall come to pass in that day a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. They shall lay hold every man on the hand of his neighbor, 
and, hand, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Judah shall fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. He said, this plague will even be of the horse, the mule, the camel, and the ass, and of all the beasts is in the tents is this. But it's going to just wipe the earth clean of those people that have come to fight against Jerusalem at that time. Then it says this very important thing. It shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? What on earth? I mean, I can understand the, the importance that well, I'm God. I say keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Therefore, you will all keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's just establishing who God is. And that, I suppose that's good enough, but yet knowing God, one knows that there are other reasons why he does the things that he does. And I, I re began to realize some time ago that there was a significance to the Feast of Tabernacles that many of us really perhaps hadn't given enough attention to. And that is that all mankind who live upon this planet are temporary. We are sojourners. We are passing through this world. We are here today. We are gone tomorrow. And the Feast of Tabernacles is a reminder to all of us that we live out our lives in tents, that our bodies are like a tent that grows old, that wears out, that poles break, that ropes fray and come apart, and so forth. And over the period of time, our bodily tents finally return to dust. But that's not all there is to man. And so we make this confession once a year at the Feast of Tabernacles that, well, we're living in tents. We are sojourners here. We are pilgrims. This world is not our home. We're looking for something else. But listen to this. It shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them there shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is not optional. Do you understand what he's saying? This feast is not optional. It's mandatory, and there are sanctions against people who don't do it. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So when you think about that, all Israelite born living in booths, and you think, well, that's just having to do with them. Well, no, that just has to do with their coming out of Egypt. He says, all of them shall live in booths that they may remember that I made them dwell in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. That's not why Egypt keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They didn't come out of Egypt and live in booths like the Israelites did. The festival will have a different significance, let's say a transcendent significance, for all mankind above and beyond what it has for the Jews. The Jews have a basic historical, religious significance to all their festivals that apply to them as a people. But every one of these festivals has a transcendent meaning for mankind that applies to Jew and Gentile alike. And in fact, as I have said elsewhere, and I won't go into today, every one of these festivals are Christian in their significance. Every one of them points to Christ. Every one of them points to the ministry of Christ. Every one of them points to what Jesus is doing, where he is taking us, and what he intends to do with us. And he expects us to keep them. We are commanded to keep them. The question is sometimes asked, you know, well, do you believe the festivals are required for salvation? Now, candidly, I'm not really sure what people are asking me when they ask that question, but look at what it says to the Egyptians. If you don't come up here, there's not going to be any rain. If you, don't, if you don't get the rain and still don't come up, there's going to be the plague. You will come up here, and you will keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and there are sanctions if you don't do it. So I would say the Feast of Tabernacles is required. We'll talk about this for salvation issue another time. In that day, there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Now, this is a remarkable statement, and I don't think it's very well understood. I, I don't know that I understood it for a very long time. But I want you to just keep your finger here, because we'll come back to it in a moment. But consider Exodus 28. I'm going to begin reading in verse 33. Now, this is an interesting little, little comparison. Notice, let me, first of all, let me read that passage to you again. Uh, there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness to the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Exodus 38, 33. Now, Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe 
with gold bells between them. What robe? The priest's robe. This is the robe the priest is going to wear when he goes in to attend before God. The gold bells in the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe. Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he will not die. In other words, we've got to know that he's in there. We've got to know he's still moving around in there. Then he says, make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it as a seal, holy to the Lord. Do you realize what Zechariah is saying? He is saying that in old times, it was the high priest who had the golden bells on the hem of his garment and a plate that said, holy to the Lord. In this time, there shall be on the bells of horses holiness to the Lord. And then he continues, you know, it, it, again, it isn't just the exalted state of the, of the priest that's holy to God. Even the horses are holy to God at this time, and they have the golden bells on them. And it's not just the, the vessels in the temple that are holy. Read on in verse 21 now, back in Zechariah 14. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and cook in them. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now, that last sentence is odd, but the overall impression of what he's giving you here is that the whole city, the whole land of Judah, everything around there is holy. And the steak you are charcoaling on your backyard barbecue is holy to God. It isn't just the altar. It isn't just the temple. It isn't just one place. It's everywhere. It's in, in Ju Judah and Jerusalem here. And how we might take that beyond that, I don't know. But at the moment, let's just understand something. That at this point in time, everything is holy. Not just a priest and not just a place and not just a particular set of sanctified pots in Jerusalem. And you do know every animal killed for food is, in a manner of speaking, a sacrifice if it is done so. You know, we often puzzle, why sacrifices when Christ comes back? Why do we have all that going on? Well, you look at Zechariah, it seems to reach out a little further than, than just animal sacrifices in the temple by an Islamic priesthood. It's everybody. And, of course, the reference to sacrificing an animal, I mean, if you're going to kill an animal, to eat the animal, it could be called, and apparently may, may well be called, a sacrifice. And, adding on to what I've said before, Everyone keeps the Feast of Tabernacles. No exceptions. So, you know, when you read all this, it, it becomes a very strong statement about what God expects of us. John chapter 7. This was one of the really significant points in Jesus' ministry, and it had to do particularly with the Feast of Tabernacles. In John 7, it says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. He couldn't walk in Judah because they were trying to kill him all the time, and it was just too much trouble. You know, you're always dodging somebody, ducking behind something, having to come out of a crowd. And so he just stayed in Galilee. Now, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And his brethren said, Depart hence and go to Judea, that your disciples can see the work you do. For there's no man that does anything in secret. He himself seeks to be known openly. If you're going to do these things, show yourself to the world. Now, it's obvious his brethren were being a little sarcastic, because it says neither did his brethren believe in him. So they were putting the pressure on him, as it were. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come. Your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, because it, but me it hates, because I testify of it that its works are evil. In fact, you tell somebody they've done something bad, they don't like it. Go you up to this feast. I go not up yet to this feast, because my time is not yet full come. So they went on, he stayed behind, and when his brethren were gone, he decided then to go up also to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Now, this is easier than you might think, because Jesus' face, while it was familiar to a few people, most people had never seen him. There was no television. You didn't have newspapers. You didn't have photographs of people circulating all over the place. Most people had no idea Jesus walking alone by himself would attract no attention whatsoever. It was his entourage, oftentimes, that created the attraction or the interest. He went up secretly, and the Jews looked for him at the feast and said, Where is he? Because they couldn't imagine that Jesus would not be there. There was a lot of murmuring among the people concerning him. Some people said, He's a good man. Other people said, No, he's not. He's deceiving the people. No one, though, would speak openly about Jesus for fear of the Jews. 
Nobody was going to stand up and advocate. Nobody was going to stand up publicly and say good things about him. It would be worth your life. Right in the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How on earth does this man, who has never learned, that is, he's never sat at the feet of Gamaliel, he's never sat at the feet of any of the great rabbis, how does he know the things that he knows? And Jesus answered, My doctrine isn't mine. It's his that sent me. If any man will do his will, you'll know the doctrine, whether it's of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory. He that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true. Then there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keep the law? Why are you going about to kill me? Boy, this is a dramatic moment. Right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, a group of Jews are standing there, challenging him on some doctrinal point. And Jesus said, you claim to follow the law of Moses, but you don't do it. Why are you trying to kill me? And they said, you're crazy. You've got your demon possessed. Who's going about to kill you? They knew who was. They didn't know that he knew. And Jesus answered and said, I've done one work, and you marvel. I have identified what you know that you and others are planning on doing, and you're surprised that I was able to know that. I've done one work, and you marvel. Moses gave you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of the fathers. You will circumcise a man on the Sabbath day. Now, if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, so the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? This is a big issue between him and them. He'd come into synagogues or wherever it was, and he would heal people on the Sabbath day. And they didn't like that. They thought, come six days a week to be healed. Don't become to be healed on the Sabbath day. And every time I read this, I just I, I feel like taking my fist and whacking the side of my head to see if I'm my, all my brain cells are in a row. How can you criticize a man who is able to heal sick people? But they did, because he did it on the Sabbath day. And then he comes with this inescapable logic. You will actually cut a piece of skin off of a baby on the Sabbath day so the law of Moses would not be broken. How in the world can you criticize me for making a person whole on the Sabbath day? Because this was the issue, and that's what they wanted to kill him for. Judge not according to the appearances. Judge righteous judgment. Then someone out there in the crowd said, Hey, isn't that the guy they want to kill? And this is really funny because, you know, there's, there's a certain little humor in this because here's Jesus, here's a crowd of people who want to kill him, who are pretending they don't and accusing him of being demon-possessed because he figured out that they did. And then some stranger walks up and says, oh, that's the guy they want to kill, right out loud in front of everybody. But look, he's speaking boldly, and they don't say anything to him. Do the rulers indeed know that this is the Christ? This was a challenge that those men could hardly allow. We know where this man has come, but where the Christ comes, no man knows where he comes from. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, You know me, you know where I've come from, and you know I haven't come from myself. He that sent me is true. Problem is, you don't know him. They claimed they did. They claimed that was the God they served, but they didn't know him. But I know him, and I'm from him, and he has sent me. And then they tried to take him. But no man laid our hands on him because his hour was not yet come. They wanted him, but they couldn't get him. And one of the reasons I think they couldn't get him was because not one of those people who wanted him dead were willing to put their own hand on him. They wanted soldiers. They wanted officers. They wanted other people to go do it. And the other people they wanted to go do it wouldn't do it. They just wouldn't do it. They couldn't bring themselves to do it. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured these things, and they sent, chief, they sent officers to take him. And Jesus said to them, I'm going to be with you a little while, then I'm going to go back to him that sent me. You'll seek me, and you shall not find me, and where I am, there you cannot come. And the Jews said among themselves, Where is he going to go that we will not find him? Will he go the dispersed among the Gentiles? Is he going to go teach among the Gentiles? What kind of a saying is this? You'll seek me and not find me. And I, I can't come there. And in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. 
Commentaries tell us that this must have been that what they call the water day of the feast, where they did all kinds of washings, and they carried huge amounts of water, that the Temple Mount was a wash in water at this particular point because of the washings and the pourings of waters and that were done at that time. And so hence Jesus stands up and said, If any man's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, the Scripture has said, Out of his belly shall flow living water in rivers. This he spoke of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given. And many of the people, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Now, I don't know if you know what that means or not. But in the Old Testament, Moses spoke of Christ, and he said, There will come a time when God, he will send a prophet like unto me, him you will hear. That prophet, the one who was to come and be Moses again, was also the Messiah. Others said, This is the Christ. Others said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? And said, the Scripture has said, No, no, David comes out of Bethlehem, and, and, he, and the Messiah is the son of David. They were all confused about this. There was a division, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. And then came the officers to the priest, chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said, Why haven't you brought him? And here's the answer. The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's an interesting, interesting time. And the key element, and one of the, one of the big key elements in Jesus' ministry took place right at the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is a confession on our part. In Hebrews, the 8th chapter, I'm sorry, yeah, in, uh, no, sorry, 11th chapter, verse 8. Hebrews 11 and verse 8. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place he should afterward, went to receive an inheritance, obeyed and went out, having no idea where he was going. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Abraham, his entire life, lived in tabernacles, that is, tents. There was never a time when Abraham ever lived in a house. He never settled down anywhere long enough. He was never able to build a home. The most permanent place in Abraham's life was a cave where he finally buried his wife. He bought that, established it as a place that was a permanent resting place for Sarah. That was the only permanent place he or his boys ever knew. And so he was a dweller in tabernacles all of his life. He looked for a city that had foundations, whose builder and whose maker is God. In other words, he confessed by living in tabernacles he wasn't home, that he was looking for something beyond. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And therefore there sprang of one, him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and the sand by the seashore innumerable. Then he says this, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Abraham lived all of his life and never received the promises from God. What does that say about the man? It says he believed the promises were not in this life, that all that we live in this life we is tabernacles, and that the house, the city, the permanent dwelling is in a resurrection when we are with God. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. If they had been mindful of the country they came out of, they could have gone back. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. So God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Abraham confessed this all of his life, living in tabernacles. For us, it's easier than that. A lot easier than that. Keeping the feast by living, leaving home and joining our brothers and our sisters in worship of God, where he gathers with us, that is our confession, that we are strangers, that we are pilgrims, and we look for a city that has foundations and for a better world than this one. There are only 104 days to the Feast of Tabernacles. Shouldn't you be getting ready?